these are cars of the 20s, unique in the skill and craftsmanship that went into their construction. Fortunes were spent preparing and rating them. The First World War had ended and long-lasting peace with unlimited prosperity seemed to lie ahead. These are cars of the golden age of motor racing. Only seven months after the armistice, Marshal Foch is talking with Louis Chevrolet at the Indianapolis 500 miles victory sweepstakes. A few hastily assembled new cars and many leftovers bring motor racing back again. It's a tough race with a number of mechanical failures and accidents. Three men are killed. Bellows, which had been designed and built at a cost of some $120,000, are disappointing. Luckily, Chazanne is not seriously hurt. The race is won on a French Peugeot, owned and stored during the war by the American Speedway and driven by Howdy Wilcox. Next year, all their large cars will be obsolete, for the maximum engine size is to be almost cut by half. The great American sports boom has started. Tommy Milton, driving this Duesenberg at over 156 miles an hour, joins Jack Dempsey, Babe Ruth and Bobby Jones. Gaston Chevrolet and his brother also have new American cars for the 500. All have three-litre engines, the size set for the still non-existent French Grand Prix. French hopes are high, with Chazanne, Thomas and Dio, and goo. Besides new eight-cylinder bellows which have already proved to be the fastest cars here. It is Joe Boyer on one of the Chevrolet cars in the lead. But the Chevrolet cars run into serious trouble. They have faulty steering arms. It looks like a certain win for a bellow, driven by the American ace De Palma. Only 14 laps to go, and it's De Palma's mechanic. He seems to have run out of petrol. No, it's a faulty magneto. But although he gets going, he's lost the lead. Bellow has just failed to achieve his great ambition, to win a major race for France. Gaston Chevrolet has the first win on an American-built car since 1912, and well over $36,000 in his pocket. This summer, motor racing starts again in France with cycle cars. They start in pairs, and there is little room for overtaking. It is a brave effort, but the roads of France have been devastated by years of war. Once again, the people of Europe see the victory of man over machine. It is a battering for both. And a sturdy little two-stroke major that carries Violet and his large mechanic to victory. A team of French Bugattis is in the light car race next day. These cars, with their pear-shaped radiators, are so much faster that at least one rival is lapped twice by a Bugatti before he has got round once. It is a cheering return to racing for France and for Bugatti. Henry Ford is at Indianapolis to see De Palma try again with the bellow. But it is Tommy Milton who wins on another of the Chevrolet cars. Now the moment has arrived for the first post-war French Grand Prix, and De Palma has come to Europe to drive in the Ballot team. 
the greatest of international motoring events is once again at Le Mans. De Palma goes off well, but the beautifully prepared white and blue American Duesenbergs are equally fast. The hydraulic brakes on their cars prove a great innovation, and the American drivers take to road racing with gusto. Then at 12 laps, Jean Chazanne on a ballot tries to snatch the lead for France. He succeeds, and there is an epic battle between the blue French car and the Americans. It's all very sporting, nobody gives an inch. No less than 14 tyres were changed by one newcomer, Seagrave, desperately keen to win his place with a British team. The few remaining cars hold together, and it's an American Duesenberg that comes in first at an average of over 78, driven by Jimmy Murphy. De Palma is second, Ballo has just lost a game to the Americans. When the enterprising junior car club organizes a race for light cars at Brooklands, Seagrave is an established member of the Sunbeam Talbot Derrick team. The one cunningly creeping forward is Malcolm Campbell. Seagrave's team manager is certain of success and planned that Bill Lee Guinness should come in first but the ambitious young Seagrave disapproves of rigging races and comes through. It's his first big win, and all is forgiven. <laughs> Strasbourg. The French Grand Prix is here again, with a two-litre limit. The race is due to start at 8 a.m. after a pouring wet night. Seagrave has had his new sunbeam specially painted in Germany. Italy is back with Felice Nazaro, the pre-war champion, on a Fiat. This is the first ever mass start of a Grand Prix, and it's Felice Nazaro in the lead. It's Fiat, Bugatti, Roland Pila, Ballo, Fiat, Sunbeam, Bugatti. A real battle between nations, and only the start of a 500-mile race. Nazaro, who used to drive the giant Edwardian cars so well, is proving just as much at home with these far smaller cars and their highly stressed engines. is outstanding, and they are soon well out in front. This little Aston Martin, with only a one and a half litre engine, puts up a brilliant show until Count Zborowski runs into magneto trouble. Bugattis haven't yet got the road holding for which they are to become famous. Fiat's are outclassing all other cars today and are now first, second, and third. Here's Goose Ballow. Ballow has been unlucky again. His brave venture is coming to an end. However, worse is to happen to the Fiat team. A Fiat loses a rear wheel, and Nazaro's young nephew, Biagio, is killed. Evidently, the rear axle isn't strong enough, and to prove this... The same thing happens to Bordino's car. Let's not forget the riding mechanics who took such risks with little glory. 
Meanwhile, the Axel is still holding on Nazaro's car, and he leads the race unaware of the tragedy. Nazaro wins for Italy, averaging just under 80 for over six and a quarter hours. It is said that after the race, a rear wheel fell off his car on being tapped with a mallet. Nearly an hour later, two Bugattis come in to take second and third places. Nazaro's sensational win and Fiat's return to racing cost £100,000. But they have set a new standard in racing car design. Indeed, this French Grand Prix finds new sunbeams looking remarkably like last year's winning Fiat. Bugatti remains individual in design. The latest Fiat's are again a sensation. Their secret is supercharging, and it is the first appearance of supercharged cars in the Grand Prix. Fiat Enterprise isn't rewarded. All their cars drop out, stones and grit wrecking the superchargers. The tremendous pace has caused havoc. Late in the race, very much to his surprise, Seagrave, who had been slowed in the early stages with a slipping clutch, finds himself the first British driver to win the French Grand Prix. Much to his disgust, he is given a glass of champagne, which he always disliked, but there isn't any water available. The Germans are in Sicily with a team of supercharged Mercedes. They are returning to racing with Dr. Ferdinand Porsche as chief engineer. They are up against several works teams and a vast private hispano suiza Races can be lost and won by pit work. One of the Mercedes team today is a man called Neubauer, who is hoping to make his name as a racing driver. He will do no better than 15th in this race, but he will become the most famous team manager in the world. The race is won by Werner on a Mercedes, but the Germans are not invited to the French Grand Prix. There's a new Italian team at Lyon, Alfa Romeo with the famous P2, and they have one of the great drivers of all time, Antonio Ascari. The driver of number 19 is Enzo Ferrari. Bordino again has a Fiat. As expected, a Sunbeam takes the lead. They are the fastest cars here today. It is Seagrave on number one. Then the sunbeam starts to misfire mysteriously, and Bordino takes the lead. Then Ascari leads on an Alpha. The strain on men and machines is tremendous. 500 miles at an average of over 70. Seven hours with little chance of relaxing for a second. The race is halfway through when another green car goes into the lead. It is Bill Lee Guinness. Seagrave, way behind in race order, is holding formation. But sunbeams are out of luck. Lee Guinness loses a tire tread, and Seagrave is plagued all day by a faulty magneto. Ascari comes back into the lead. Then, in the very last stages, his car refuses to start after a pit stop, and his teammate, Campari, wins on another Alpha. Giuseppe Campari hasn't Seagrave's dislike of alcohol. In the Italian Grand Prix, Ascari and the Alpha team come in first, second, third and fourth. Improved Alphas are in Belgium for the Grand Prix, but France has produced a yet more powerful car, the 12-cylinder Lelage with its twin superchargers.
last year there were many fatal accidents and riding mechanics are now banned. The delages are fast but have teething troubles. Alphas win again with a great Ascari at the top of his form. Ascari comes to Montlieri for the French Grand Prix. quarter distance, Antonio Ascari does his last lap. On a fast bend, his car leaves the road and one of the greatest of all drivers is killed. The other alphas are withdrawn as a mark of respect. This is the first time France has won her Grand Prix for over ten years, but it is a hollow victory for Delage and for Robert Benoist, who with characteristic chivalry will place his winner's garlands on the wreckage of Ascari's car. This film of the alpha team is taken in France before the tragic race. And here is one last look at the great Antonio Ascari. Their hero is dead as the crowds flock to Monza to see the swan song of the P2 Alpha. Next year, a new formula will reduce Grand Prix engines to one and a half litres. Bugatti has come to Italy with his team. His cars have a beauty and craftsmanship that will always be loved and cherished but he obstinately refuses to supercharge, giving them far less power than their rivals. The Duesenbergs are being driven by Peter Kreiss and Tommy Milton. Sunbeams have given up. Britain has only one privately entered Eldridge. The Alpha team include Campari and Count Rilly Perry. Last minute instructions include how to work the flag. As the last seconds tick away, someone stands in front of the camera, and they're off. Again, the P2 Alphas are out in front, although for one lap, Peter Christ takes the lead for America. For a short, exciting time, Tommy Milton gets within striking distance, only to drop back later. Billy Perry's pit work is rapid. It's still limited to the driver and one mechanic, although he no longer rides. Billy Perry is taking the lead. Campari lost time. It's a win for Brilli Perry. Campari brings another P2 into second place. The very successful two-litre formula is ending. It has been dominated by Italy, first with Fiat's and then Alphas. The light car races have seen the invincible Talbot sweep home time after time. There is one hitch, right at the end of a race at Montlieri, when Count Canelli challenges his teammate. He crossed the line upside down. It's a wasted effort. George Duller wins, and the Count is second with a few bruises and explanations to give his team manager. The new formula, and a French Grand Prix with only three cars. Reduced to one and a half litre engines, Bugatti has given in and fitted superchargers, but there is no competition. Until now, there has been little spectacle in sports car racing. A limit on fuel consumption tended to cut down speed. Although it was all taken very seriously, with technical experts to help and plenty of skilled supervision. Every part of the cars got the same rigorous testing. It's the racing that just hasn't the real Grand Prix atmosphere.
that is until a sports car race at Le Mans. The 24-hour Grand Prix d'Endurance captures everyone's imagination. This is real motor racing with cars that can be used for family outings. Even the hoods must be put up for the opening laps. It's a major international event with British Bentleys and French Lorraine Dietrichs competing for high honours. Lorraine Dietrichs come in first, second and third, giving an overwhelming victory to France. Motor racing in the States is different. There is no shortage of spectacle, but it is more of a demonstration of human courage than of automobile engineering. But it isn't just a circus. Track racing does develop high-speed cars. At Indianapolis, there's a win at just over 100 for Peter De Paolo in a supercharged Duesenberg. The Miller is also an advanced design. And here's another famous winner, Frank Lockhart. By August, Grand Prix racing is reviving in Europe. And there's a team of new one and a half litre Delages for the RAC Brooklyn's Grand Prix. The new cars have teething troubles, but they are good enough to win all the same. The new formula isn't applied in Germany. And this Grand Prix might have been forgotten if it wasn't for number 14 a privately entered Mercedes driven by a young car salesman, Rudy Caracciola. Number 14 has stalled. This is the chance the young enthusiast begged for and he is already left behind. Then on the fifth lap it begins to rain. Adolf Rosenberger on a second Mercedes crashes while in the lead. Urban Emmerich then leads and also crashes. Fantastically, however, the rain has not slowed Rudy Caracciola and a completely unknown driver wins a Grand Prix. There is growing public interest in the world's land speed record. The first man to reach 150 miles an hour officially is Malcolm Campbell with a sunbeam. Seagrave now takes the record by a small margin. A month later, Paddy Thomas, a gifted engineer and designer, puts the record up by nearly 20 miles an hour with his aero-engined car, Babs. A great battle is now on to be the first man to reach three miles a minute. In January, Campbell arrives at Pendine with a completely new car, the Napier Campbell Bluebird. He takes the record, but just fails to reach the magic 180. On Thursday, the 3rd of March, Paddy Thomas is feeling better after a bout of flu and decides to make his bed. On the first two runs, Babs is fast, but not fast enough. On the third, she is seen to be smoking. One of the great individuals of motor racing is dead. Meanwhile, in Florida, all the ballyhoo of the time is underway. Seagrave's new Sunbeam has two aero engines. In such a car, the tyres can only be guaranteed for a life of three and a half minutes flat out. His speed, both ways, works out at over 203 miles an hour. President Dumerg and Monsieur Brion are at Montlieri for the French Grand Prix.
Faced with the now fabulous Delage, Bugatti has withdrawn his works team and the entry is small. The Talbots are fast, but they do not stand the pace. The day finishes with Delage's first, second and third. No wonder Louis Delage is pleased as he poses with Chamberlain and Levine, the latest flyers across the Atlantic. The winner is Robert Benoist, a man who drove and lived with courage and enthusiasm. During the war, he died as a leader of the resistance. He is driving the only Delage to compete against the latest front drive Miller in the Italian Grand Prix. On a wet road, Benoist averages over 90 to win by 22 minutes. He has started in five races this year and won them all. Women are now proving that they can be as fast as most men. Some women motorists achieve great fame. This winner of a Grand Prix d'honneur is called Miss Danguette. The holiday meetings at Brooklands are also great fun. You may see Kay Don with one of the last of the Grand Prix Sunbeams. Or a Benz, alleged to have been Hindenburg's staff car in the Kaiser War. Just look how the ancient Benz leaves behind two modern sports cars. And if you had all that worked out, you may even take some money home. Britain has always been the home of amateurs, and at Brooklands they can all have a go. While on the continent, a champion motorcyclist, Nuvolari, has just bought a Bugatti like many other Italians. This is the heyday of Bugattis, and they are raced all over Europe by wealthy amateurs as well as professionals. This Rome Grand Prix isn't Nuvolari's lucky day, although he won last year. For the fourth time running, a Bugatti comes in first. The driver this time is the debonair Louis Chiron. The green British Bentleys won at Le Mans last year and they are being challenged by a Black Hawk Stutz and four Chryslers from America. The Bentley boys are becoming a legend, and this time it's Wolf Bonato, the prodigious millionaire, who wins. Bernard Rubin is on the right. There never has been anything like motor racing to demonstrate the effectiveness of the latest developments in automobile engineering. One of the most revolutionary cars of all appears in the last year of the 20s, the Golden Arrow. Seagrave is out to regain the land speed record from the American Ray Keach, who raised it to 207. record is shattered by nearly 24 miles an hour. Seagrave has joined Lindbergh as one of the international heroes of the time. He is the first man to be knighted for a motoring achievement, and among the telegrams is one from His Majesty King George V. Grand Prix racing gets new glamour with the inauguration of the Monaco Grand Prix. It is a perfect circuit for Bugattis, and a green one driven by an Englishman, Williams, leads for most of the time. He is, however, challenged and for a time actually passed by a vast white Mercedes, this difficult and unsuitable car being driven by Caracciola. 
It is said that Williams only had top gear left when he won. This modest man also died as a resistance leader. The works Bentleys for the Brooklyn's double 12 are fitted with spring clips. They are said to make the hood fixing particularly rapid. This is the longest race ever held in Britain, a handicap for all sizes with two days of hard racing, the cars being locked up overnight. The Bentleys are fastest, but a smaller Alfa Romeo just leads on handicap, Ramponi taking the major award for Italy. None who saw them, however, will forget the great Bentleys thundering through the field. Le Mans sees the same green cars carrying British prestige to new heights. There are six American cars this year, three Stutz, two Chryslers and a DuPont. It is a complete British victory with Bentley's first, second, third and fourth. Bonato is partnered by Tim Burkett. Ireland starts her own Grand Prix and makes it a sports car race. It's a hot day and the newly tarred corners add to the fun. are again fastest, but Glenn Kidston, when in the lead, loses valuable seconds and damages a wheel. Again, it's an Alfa Romeo that takes the major award on handicap. In this golden age of sports car racing, the tourist trophy is revived and has everything. Fords are drawn up next to the works Bugattis, and was there ever a start quite like this? W.O. Bentley himself went along as riding mechanic for Tim Birkin. I took on the job, he recalls, because I thought our mechanics were beginning to consider themselves heroes. After the race, I realized they were right. On top of everything, it rains, and once again, everyone goes slower, except a man called Caracciola. A second Mercedes is driven by Otto Mertz. The veteran giant rips off a damaged wing, an observer takes a note, and he is disqualified. So Rudy Caracciola comes through to win the TT and emerges as one of the stars of the future. The last great race of the 20s is one of the fastest, the Brooklyn's 500, a handicap round the outer circuit with the accent on sustained high speed. Many names have faded away from racing, the large, Duesenberg, Fiat, Sunbeam. And this is to be one of the last wins for the Bentley Works team. The twenties are nearly over and the company is in financial difficulties. The stock market on Wall Street is crashing and the silent film is giving way to the talkies. Would you say a few words? Movies, what should we talk about, Jack? This has been a decade of rapid technical development. But we remember above all the courage of the men who so willingly risked their lives in the cars of the golden age of motor racing. We're both very happy to have won this wonderful race, and we think you're all very nice to have made such a fuss of us. Uh, <laughs> yes, I quite agree. All I'm waiting for now is a drink. <laughs> <laughs>